Hello everyone, welcome to Luxor. Today I'm taking you to the amazing necropolis of Deir el Medina. I've been here many times, but today's trip will be special. Today we're heading back to Deir el Medina to see some of the tombs which are actually closed for the visitors. Over 500 tombs, mostly of the Egyptian middle class from the New Kingdom period. 50 of them are decorated with beautiful paintings. These are the tombs of the inhabitants of Set Mat, the place of truth, where the best craftsmen and artists in the service of the pharaohs lived and worked, creating wonderful royal tombs. A closed, isolated community of about a thousand people lives right here in the desert. Lots to explore ahead of us, so let's go! The first tomb, TT 335, belongs to Naktamun, a sculptor from times of Ramesses the Great. It's the deepest of all tombs here. We'll go seven meters down. In the first chamber, we can see a beautifully made painting depicting Naktamun's large family, all gathered around him. Despite the reduced number of colors, the paintings in the tomb delight with details. A must-have for the high society of the 19th dynasty. Perfume cones on both men's and women's wigs. As befits Ramasidic noblewomen, they wear long wigs, fastened at the top with a decorative headband, with a lotus flower on the front. You can clearly see the sparse long braids, an extension of the wig. The daughter of the deceased, Upkat, holds a ceremonial vase in front of her parents' faces. Behind Naktamun, his wife Nebuem Sheset, with a rather unusual for the funerary art smile on her face. Here, the youngest of his children, son Penknum and daughter Nedjemet. It's really amazing that after thousands of years we know all these names. Two coffins in front of the entrance to the burial chamber. Naktamun wanted to fit in a small space the most important images of his time. It shows an unnaturally elongated pyramid with a Theban mountain behind it, the symbol of the necropolis. Again, wife of the deceased, Nebuem Sheset in front of Naktamun's parents, signed as Osiris P, and a sister, the mistress of the house Maka, which means she is simply his wife. The art is depicted in an extremely detailed way, the chairs on which they sit and even the straw mats under their feet. The inscription above the scene means made by Osiris, who hears the words in the place of truth, Naktamun justified. It heralds the successful outcome of the weighing of his heart at the judgment of Osiris, salvation and eternal life. But what if the verdict of the God of the dead wouldn't have been in his favor? Those who, at the judgment of Osiris, turned out to be sinful, their performances disturbed the mad, the cosmic order, were called the enemies of Osiris. The fate of the damned is described and illustrated in detail in a funerary text from the New Kingdom period. The Book of Amduat, the Book of What is in the Underworld, 
describes the abode of the damned as a place of fire, torture and dismemberment. The Amduat was illustrated with scenes from the Place of Annihilation, where the somber enemies of Osiris are decapitated by demons in his presence. Headless, which means devoid of identity, they kneel before Osiris, their arms tied behind their back, they bleed to death, awaiting incineration. In the book we read, Ra to Osiris, let your enemies fall beneath your feet. The flames of the living serpent are against them, that he might burn them. A violent of face is against them, a cat-headed demon, that he might cut them down and roast them on a spit for himself. Along with the cut pieces of flesh, the demons also burned souls and shadows in special cauldrons. It's remarkably similar to the concept of hell in later religious traditions, don't you think? The Chamber of Offering, the second of the three rooms in the tomb, a beautiful image of the ibis-headed god of wisdom and knowledge, Thoth, who records the results at the court of Osiris. The ram-headed deity embodies the united nature of Ra with Osiris. Osiris became Ra's nocturnal form, his Ba. Now we must go back to the first chamber, from where, through a tiny passage, which in antiquity was closed with a wooden door, we'll reach the most beautiful chamber of the tomb. The renaissance of the solar cult in the 19th dynasty is not only the pyramids above the tombs, which I will soon show you. The first image we see in the burial chamber is the god of the sun. The third chamber, 4.7 meters long and 2.2 meters wide, is perfectly preserved. Its paintings look like they were made yesterday. See for yourself. The south wall and a scene in the tent of purification. Anubis, the god of funerary rites, bends over Nactamun's mummy holding the adz, the ritual censer, with which he will perform the opening of the mouth ritual. He is assisted by Isis and Nephthys, sisters of Osiris. In this monochromatic tomb, the mummy's face is the only one painted reddish-brown. It's an amazing experience to be so close to all those paintings they are thousands years old, and you can even see now the bubbles of her caught in the paint. It's an, it's an amazing. On perfectly preserved paintings, we can see important deities for the deceased, such as Maat. And no, it's not Knum or Osiris Ra. It's quite an unusual depiction of Anubis. Nactamun's father, Osiris P, makes an incense offering to Ptah. The great god creator was also the patron of craftsmen, so he was of great importance to the deceased. Above, on the ceiling, an amazing scene. It's the god Ra in the form of the great cat of Heliopolis fighting with knives against the eternal enemy, the serpent Apopis. The Egyptians believed that this fight took place every night, the stakes being whether the sun would rise in the morning. Nactamun in the leopard skin of a Sem priest before the statue of Osiris, his Ka. 
Nectamun performs a libation ritual. He pours the water onto plants. The goddesses Satet and Wajet, and the pharaoh of the 18th dynasty worshipped by craftsmen, Amenhotep I. An interesting combination of goddesses. Anuket worshipped in the south and Taweret in the north. Quite a unique depiction of Taweret with a human head. Shown here as a pregnant hippopotamus, she was a daughter of Ra, wife of Set, beloved guardian deity of pregnant women and babies. She protected homes and families from evil spirits. On the ceiling we see the four sons of Horus. Imseti, Duamutef, Happy, and Kebasenuev, associated with the four canopic jars, in which, according to the ancient beliefs, the important organs of the deceased, the lungs, liver, intestines and stomach removed during mummification were stored. The god of wisdom and knowledge, Toth, depicted as a baboon, his other animal form besides the ibis, with a, a lunar disc on his head. Thoth was the god of the moon. He sits on a temple adorned with images of praying baboons. The god of writing holds a scribe's tablet in his hand. Leaving the chamber through a tiny corridor only 70 centimeters wide and 1.5 meters high, it's easy to overlook the ceiling with the image of the mother of the gods the ancient goddess of the sky, Nut, with her head turned east. She's another example of a rather unusual depiction, since her divinity is indicated only by the tight-fitting dress, which were worn a thousand years earlier during the Old Kingdom. The dress contrasts with those loose, pleated New Kingdom robes. In general, however, until Roman times, deities and demons were depicted as in the times of the Great Pyramids. I showed you the famous village of workers and the Temple of Hathor in the previous episode from Deir el Medina, link in the description. Today I want to take you a bit further from the tourist trail to show you places unknown to most. Fifty-two meters deep, the Great Pit has stairs on the inside walls. We know that during the late period it was used as villagers' rubbish dump. Numerous figurines, furniture, clothing and pottery have been found here. Was the Great Pit created by trying to dig a well that wasn't in the village? What this huge hole in the ground was originally for remains a mystery. Tourists are not allowed here. As you can see, it's easy to have a serious accident. On the west side of the wall of the Hathor Ptolemic Temple, we see the remains of the Ramasit shrines of Maat, Hathor and the cult temple of Amenhotep I, who was revered as the patron of the village. These are the tombs from the Sayite period, at the northern end of the necropolis. No one actually comes here, and I advise you not to either. Tombs are dark, the floor is moving, the shafts are very deep. In short, it's very dangerous here.
Right next to the Seiyai tombs, we come across human skulls with remains of mummified skin. The so-called Seiyai period is the beginning of the late period of ancient Egypt, the time of the 26th dynasty ruling from the city of Sais, the last dynasty before the first Persian conquest of Egypt. The greatest discovery in Der el Medina was made by the Italian archaeologist Ernesto Schiaparelli in 1906. The untouched tomb of Ka, overseer of works, and his wife Merit from the 18th dynasty. Ka was responsible for the royal tombs of Amenhotep II, Thutmose IV, and Amenhotep III. The tomb contained 440 objects, including clothing and furniture in excellent condition, but also food left for the dead, bread, meat and wine. It's the best preserved non-royal tomb in all of Egypt. Fewer ceremonial items were found in it than in royal and noble tombs, but more everyday items, such as bronze razors, 50 loincloths that served as undergarments, tunics, shawls and kilts. Schiaparelli claimed that upon its discovery, Merit's wig still shined with the perfumed oils that were applied to it. In a coffer of Merit perfumes, multicolored glass bottles were found, which when opened were said to still smell after more than 3000 years. The mummies of the couple were found in beautiful sarcophagi. Their bandages have never been unwrapped, but thanks to the X-ray and CT scans, we know their bodies have been adorned with rich jewelry. Everything discovered in the tomb can be admired today in the Museo Egizio in Turin and in the Cairo Museum. We see the remains of probably one of the cultic chapels located between the village and the Temple of Hathor. I was lucky enough to be able to move freely around the necropolis and look at the many anonymous tombs. As I mentioned before, there are hundreds of them here. The burial structures in the workers' village weren't plain or simple, as one could imagine. They actually displayed smaller or simpler versions of the most significant elements of ancient Egyptian religious architecture. The overground part consisted of an entrance flanked by a small pylon, an indispensable component of every ancient Egyptian temple. Then one or two courtyards led to a chapel, naturally oriented eastwards, which housed the statue of the deceased. It was the place where the family could make offerings or perform rituals. Above the cult chapel there was a mud brick pyramid capped by a limestone pyramidion. The front wall of the pyramid featured a niche for a stele. It displayed a simplified solar hymn preceded by an image of the solar bark carved or painted on the round arch. Either inside the chapel or in the courtyard, a vertical burial shaft led to the most beautifully decorated vaulted underground chambers, a hallway and one or more burial chambers. As in every woman's handbag, I always have a construction flashlight with me. You never know when it might come in handy. Rare view inside the chapel of the tomb of Irenefer, TT290, from the time of Ramesses II. I'll try to enter his tomb another time.
Now let's imagine how amazing this slope looked in antiquity, almost entirely covered with soaring pyramids of various sizes. The entire funerary structure symbolized the macrocosm of ancient Egyptian beliefs. The pylon not only symbolized the barrier between the chaos and order, good and evil, but also the horizon, the place where the sun rises. The pyramid above the chapel carried a very powerful at that time solar aspect of the tomb. The new life could be achieved only through the creator, Amun Ra. The chapel served as a place of worship to the gods and the deceased, whereas the substructure, the underground part, represented the afterlife. It's time to go back. Hundreds of closed tombs of Deir al Medina are waiting to be explored. I'll definitely come back here to show you much more. It's time to relax by the pool in the shade under the palm trees. I stayed once again in my favorite Villa El Hag on the banks of the Nile. I highly recommend this place. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you might also enjoy my other playlists from Greece, Turkey and Italy. You can also consider joining my Patreon community, link in the description. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, please do it now. Like my video and leave a comment below. I want to thank all patrons for supporting my channel. You are the best. And see you on another ancient site.